Grace, mercy and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Text for the address is the Gospel reading where someone in the crowd says to him, Teacher, tell my brother to invite the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? He said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness One's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you richly bestow upon us all these gifts in our life to sustain us in this life and to glorify you as we live in this life. Help us, Lord, to use the gifts that you have given us shrewdly to proclaim you to those around us and to glorify you as we wait for our eternal uplifting. Amen. Someone in the crowd says to Jesus, tell my brother to invite the, to divide the inheritance with me. Let's say Jesus says, okay, let's go, we'll do this. And they go. So Jesus can tell the inquirer's brother to divide the inheritance. The inheritance is divided. What then? Does everyone live happily ever after? Maybe, but most likely not. What type of relationship do you think the two brothers had after Jesus intervened in the dispute? If the two could not come or settle their differences or come to an agreement beforehand, there is very little chance that after the fact things would have been worse, they would have deteriorated even further. What would the two brothers' opinion of Jesus be? Well, both would have had a wrong opinion of Jesus, I suspect. One brother would have been bitter and resentful for Jesus doing what he did and the other, although he may have been pleased with Jesus' intervention, would have believed the wrong thing about Jesus' purpose for coming into the world. But no, Jesus is not a divider of inheritances and he is not a divider of relationships. He came to be a reconciler. Resolving each person's relationship with God the Father. And only in our reconciliation with God can a person expect to have a God-pleasing settlement with another person. Jesus does not name the person in the crowd, nor does he call him friend. Rather, he impersonally and abruptly says, Man, who made me a judge and arbitrator over you? Jesus cannot be a friend of covetousness, justify and mediating a person's greed for riches that don't allow God the Father to be first. He says to the man in the crowd, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. One's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Possessions here literally means things under which you submit first or the things you serve as your God. These things we call goods. But the problem with many, making these goods our gods is they destroy human relationships and ultimately our relationship with God the Father. So Jesus tells a parable to demonstrate to the crowd what happens when we make gods out of his gifts by conserving them, trusting in them for our security, or liberally using them to extravagantly serve ourselves in pleasure. If Jesus had helped the man to get his share 
of the inheritance, Jesus would have helped him become like the rich man in the parable. So as we hear the parable, notice to whom the rich man speaks. The land of a rich man produced plentifully and he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this, I will tear down my barns and build larger ones and there I will store all my grain and my goods. I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink and be merry. Who does he talk to? No one. He talks to no one. He talks to himself. In the culture of Jesus' day, this would have immediately stood out to the listeners. Not so much for us today, which says something in itself for us who perhaps are a little bit more like the rich man than we would like to admit. In Middle Eastern culture of the day, the rich man would have discussed with his contemporaries what he might do. Here, though, however, he only has himself to talk to. No children, no brothers, no parents, no community, no one. It's here we begin to understand why Jesus does not do one's bidding, telling the brother to divide the inheritance. A lot more of the inheritance would have been divided if Jesus had followed the wishes of the one whose life consisted in the abundance of possessions. Jesus does not serve the sinful self in its sin. Rather, he serves the sinner in being freed from sin, from the power of death, freeing the sinner from the deeds and desires of sin. The rich man in the parable has possessions and property, but he is all alone. The wealth he received from his land produced plentifully reveals the poverty of his position in life. He made himself God of his dominion. The rich man has taken the place of God, forgetting God the Father, and also fails to remember the problem humanity has when it takes the place of God, when we take the place of God. Because we are not God, we fear losing our identity as the top dog. And to protect our position in life, rid ourselves of the competition and find ourselves only with ourselves for company. As the saying goes, it's lonely at the top. Human beings were never ever created to be God or to be alone. However, in our wealth-based society today, that's exactly what's happening. The greater our wealth grows, the more we withdraw from our neighbours and the higher our fences and our walls are, they become around us. Time is spent submitting to and serving our wealth and in the fullness of time, we find ourselves alone, separated from God and from our neighbours. The rich man finds himself alone, talking to himself, focusing on himself. Self, I've got my crops, my barn, my grain, my goods and my soul. But are they really his? Are the goods you have really yours? Can you have your cake and eat it too? It seems Jesus is pointing us to Solomon's deliberations which are written in Ecclesiastes where it says there is nothing better than for a person and he should eat, drink and find enjoyment in his toil. But unfortunately the rich man in the parable and perhaps us too when we are presumptuously consumed by our possessions overlook the next but most important part of the verse which continues... This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. 
For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? But really, is the rich man content? I know for myself, when I observe my goods to which I attribute worth and wealth, it's not long before the mirage of satisfied desires moves and I am once again unsatisfied. Our goods as gods cannot give us the peace which is only found in God. One of the church fathers, Augustine, rightly says of God the Father, my soul is restless until it finds its rest in you. When wealth and property control us, we get so easily caught up in the belief that our restlessness will stop once we have an overabundance of food and drink. But it doesn't. It doesn't. Now, Jesus knows this. In fact, in the flesh of a human, he experiences a temptation in which we are tempted and fail. But although tempted, Jesus does not succumb to temptation as we do, but faithfully followed our Heavenly Father. The rich man talking to himself is like a person who chases one's own steamy breath that vanishes in a moment on a cold, frosty morning. And that is what it says in Vanity of Vanities in Ecclesiastes. Vanity of Vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, or mist of mist, breath of breath, all is vanity. I've seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, a striving after wind. To put it in today's vernacular, the rich man is full of hot air, and not much else. At the end of the day, he doesn't even realise his own life is not his own. Life is not a right, but a gift to us on loan from God. Rich man puts his feet up in relaxation, eating and drinking in merriment. Here Jesus uses a play on words. The word merry and the word fool in Greek are both related to the word diaphragm. We might say to be in a good frame of mind, but diaphragm here suggests a good gut feeling in the torso or the midriff. Think of a relaxing sigh of breath when one has a contented tummy and is in a good frame of mind. But in the parable, Jesus says, Fool, you rich man are hot air and deluded in your comfort. When God says fool, Jesus is literally saying, the rich man has no diaphragm. He doesn't have a good frame of mind. His gut feeling of security is vanity, a chasing after the wind since his goods and possession are but a breath. So too is his life. The psalmist says, The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough that one should live on forever and not see decay. Your life and my life are on loan from God. He is the source of our life. Our life sees decay and death because of sin, but despite this, God gives us life through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is our daily bread. He's a bread that doesn't spoil. He is not susceptible to sin, even though he lived in the body of sin. He is your bread today and he is our tomorrow eternal bread. Two. St Paul says to the Colossians, do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices 
and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Jesus gives you your new self. The Holy Spirit comes to see the old self put off, destroy your false gods and renew you in the knowledge of your new self, Jesus Christ, your new Adam, in the image of your creator, who is our Father in heaven. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all our human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in our new Adam, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.